And uh, there's three things that I want to remind you about Heaven's arrival as we dive into this final conversation. And so for those of you taking notes, if you have your notes open, here's the first thing that we're going to talk about. And that is this, that Heaven's arrival will be sudden. Heaven's Heaven's arrival will be sudden. Now, we're going to look at a passage, several passages of Scripture again, like we have over the last few weeks. And we're going to be, our first passage of Scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And so if you have a Bible, whether it's in paper or digital form, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read some verses that we probably have read already once or in this series, but we just want to review this truth that heaven's arrival, Jesus' second coming, will be sudden. And so you have Matthew chapter 24, go to verse 4, and then this is what Jesus is preaching. So this is prior to Jesus' death on the cross, resurrection from the dead, and this is what he teaches, verse 4. He says, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation. Are we seeing that in our world today? For sure. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. How about uh, hurricanes? That happening? But all of this is only the first of birth pains. There's more to come. Verse 9, this is where it gets hard. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it and then the end will come. So Jesus is reminding his followers, he's reminding those of you and me, those of us who have given our heart to him, is that things are going to get really bad and hanky, but even in the midst of the badness, the the spread of the gospel is going to continue. The good news of Jesus is going to continue to triumph against darkness. Now go skip down to verse uh, 37. Matthew 24, verse 37. So Jesus continues. He says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. Y'all remember who Noah was? He explains it. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. Boy, isn't that what we just read about in North Carolina, the floods, and you think you're out of danger, right? You think, oh, I'm not on the coast. The, the, this hurricane's not going to hit me. And then suddenly, bam, there's a, you're, the water's you know, 24 feet high and, and above your tree line. That's what he says. It's, that's how the, the heaven's arrival will be sudden. People didn't realize what was going to happen again. Verse 39, until the flood came and swept them all away. And that is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working in the field. Together in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. Mill, One will be taken and the other left. So you too must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is telling us that heaven's arrival will be sudden. Now, in your Bibles, go to the back a little bit, almost to the very end, to the book of, of Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, this is a harder book to find. If you get to Hebrews, you know you're in the vicinity. It's just past Hebrews a little bit. If you get to Revelation, you've gone too far, but you're almost there. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and look at what we're told here in verse 10 about this truth that heaven's arrival will be sudden. 2 Peter verse 3, or chapter 3 verse 10, this is what we're told. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be, des- on it, on it will be found to deserve judgment. Go down to verse 13. 
Let's see, verse 13. We're looking forward, he says, to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. So remember how we've been talking about how the fact when Christ comes back, the dead in Christ are going to rise. God's going to set up this judgment throne. There's going to be a, the judgment's already going to be determined. If you've given your heart to Jesus, you know you, your final destination is heaven. Those who have not given their heart to Jesus are going to end up in hell. And we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. Then there's going to be a second judgment where we're going to be judged for how we live here on this earth and revelation 20 tells us that god's going to create this new heaven and this new earth is which which is what peter is talking about here in verse 13 and then he continues let me just read a couple more verses here verse 14 he says so dear friends while you're waiting for these things to happen make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight and remember our lord's patience gives people time to be saved So as we bring this series to a close, the first overarching point that I want us to be reminded of is this truth that heaven's arrival will be sudden. A second thing that I want us to know and and remember, point number two in your app notes, is the truth that heaven's arrival will usher in a new life chapter. Heaven's arrival will usher in a new life life chapter. This is when our mortal body is changed to an immortal body. So in your Bibles, go to the book of 1 Corinthians. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's going to reinforce this truth that heaven's arrival will usher in this new life chapter. Once you find chapter 15, skip down to verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. Look at and let what the Bible writer tells us here about heaven's arrival. He says, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, you guys remember what Adam he's talking about, right? In the beginning, God created heaven, right? Adam and Eve, right? Heavens and the earth, Adam and Eve. Are, that's the Adam he's talking about, the first man God ever created. So he says, you see, verse 22, Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Skip down to verse 52. 52. He says it will happen in a moment. We're talking about Christ's resurrection here. Christ, this new resurrection that we're going to experience. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown, but when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. So remember, again, we've talked about this. When a person dies, the Bible says that our body turns to dust and they go to what we call heaven number one, present heaven number one, uh, where their soul dwells with God. And then when Christ comes back, he's going to usher in this new heaven. And then the the, the dead are told our body's going to arrive. Those who are living here are going to also rise to meet Jesus in the air. And that's what the Apostle Paul reminds us of again here. He said, our dying bodies must be transformed, verse 53, into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, verse 54, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your string? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, and someone should say amen to this, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, he says, as a result of this truth, as the fact that Christ is going to change you into a better person, and we're all going to be changed, he says, as a result of this, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Heaven's arrival is going to usher in this new life chapter. This past week, I was invited and asked to officiate a funeral for a woman who had worked for Disneyland for decades. She was uh, 84 years old. Her husband, who had preceded her in death, had also uh, worked, uh, he had 
in the Disney family in a sense. He worked for the Anaheim Angels and also within the NASCAR racing industry. And so their house was full of vintage collectibles that were undoubtedly worth busloads of money if you're into that kind of thing, uh, which I'm not. But as I sat at their kitchen table and as I surveyed all around me this antique memorabilia that just seemed to fill every crook and cranny of their huge home up in Anaheim Hills that undoubtedly had been accumulated from a lifetime of collecting, I was reminded of this truth that our time here on this earth has a shelf life. And while death is certainly an enemy for all of us, and one might even argue that death is the final enemy, for those of us who know Jesus, we can live with this understanding that there is more to come, yes? That death is not a wall, but a turnstile. You know what a turnstile is, right? Author Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for Heaven, writes this, and I'm quoting him. He says, death is merely the doorway to a new world of grandeur and wonder, of satisfaction and joy, of flourishing friendships and stimulating experiences, of gazing with gratitude at the face of our Savior and Lord and receiving his kisses, unquote. Friends, the Bible writers throughout the scriptures testify and teach that suffering and death are only temporary and heaven's arrival will usher in a new life chapter. You know, as we talk about this eternity and this new life chapter, brothers and sisters, this world is not our home. Heaven is. And so as we wait for heaven's arrival, as we await Christ's return, here's the take home that you and I need to live out as we move forward from this series, point number three in your app notes, and that's this. Heaven's arrival invites us to live relationally considerate. Heaven's arrival invites us today to live relationally considerate. Remember the story in the Bible when Jesus was asked by this, this young man, what's the, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment a person can live out? Remember that story? And what did Jesus say? He said, love God, right? With all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, with your whole being, and love who? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your, love your neighbor. That's the golden rule. Now, with a show of hands, would you agree with me? Or how many of you would agree with me, I guess, when I say that loving God, God and loving your neighbor is sometimes easier to say than to actually do, right? Would you agree that sometimes that's kind of hard? Loving our neighbor as ourself, not only outside the church, but inside the church can be hard. I want you to turn to the book of Philippians. This is where we're going to end this conversation, almost done, believe it or not, and we're going to land the plane here. Philippians, if you go just a little bit more, so 2 Corinthians, and you have Galatians, and then Ephesians, and then Philippians, I want you to go to chapter 4, and then we're going to read a couple more verses after that, but Philippians chapter 4, and go to verse 1. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. This is what we're told. So Paul is writing, he's writing this letter to this group of Christians living in Philippi, and he's telling them how to live relationally with each other today. As they await heaven's arrival, he's basically what we're going to see here, he's going to challenge them to be relationally consider of, considerate of each other, verse 1. He said, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you, I long to see you, dear friends, for you, you are my joy and the crown I receive from my work. Now check this out, verse 2. Now I appeal to you, you to appeal to Eudia and since Chi, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. So what's that tell us? There's two women in the church who are fighting. They're not getting along with each other. And Paul's saying, would you please settle your disagreement? And says he, and he says, I ask you, my true partner, and some of your, some of your uh, translations might have the word sing Gus. So basically Gus, there's a guy in the church by the name of Gus. 
said, am I, I'm asking you, Gus, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Now, the book of life, remember in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, where we're told that people who give their heart to Jesus, their names will be put in the book of life. And so what are we told here? We're told here that there's two women who are part of the Philippian church. Their names are written in the book of life, so we know they're Christians. They're telling us here, Paul is saying, that sometimes Christians fight. Sometimes Christians disagree. Sometimes Christians don't get along, which can lead to a relational breakdown, and sometimes Christians even hold grudges, such as the case for Paul's co-workers, co-laborers. And so Paul writes this letter to them, and he's writing the same letter to you and me, that he says that although your name might be recorded in the book of life, although you belong to the Lord right, which these women did, and you're at odds with each other, Paul is challenging them. He's saying, get your stuff together. With God's help and with the help of your church family, put to bed your differences. Bring to close your disagreement. Life is too short, basically, in Mike Decker words, for you to live at odds with other people. So what? here's the transferable concept for you and to me. As we await heaven's arrival, Paul is giving us uh, this precedent saying, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, and if you have a disagreement with somebody, a relational beef with somebody, you need to take care of it. Now you say, Pastor Mike, I thought you said that when we get to heaven, probably like the first hour will be a time for reconciliation between, you know, X's and, and O's and, you know, all these people. And, I, and that's true. I think that's what the Bible suggests. That being said, Paul is saying, get it together now. And so here's the question I want you to dwell on today for the rest of our time together. Is there anybody in your life Anybody in your world who you have a fractured relationship with? An ex-spouse, maybe a spouse, maybe you fought on your way to the church today. Maybe there's a son, maybe you have a daughter, maybe you have a coworker, maybe there's a parent. Maybe you even have a beef with a pastor. You know, it's not uncommon for us as Christians, we outgrow our pastors. I mean, that, that just comes and goes. You outgrow people, and sometimes you need somebody else to feed you. And so not, it's not uncommon <clears throat> that Paul Marvis Church, for some of you, is not the first church you've ever been a part of. And it's not uncommon for me, many times when I meet somebody, if they've come from another church, to say, well, what brings you here? Well, I used to go here. Well, well what happened? Well, my pastor and I, we have a bit of a beef or he did something that I didn't like. And my first question is, or my first encouragement would be, let's go talk to your pastor. Because as a pastor, we want to bless people. We want to send people out. We want people when they leave our church to feel permission to come back to the church because we're a part of the same family. And if you've left your church and people do all the time, they say, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, then you're not welcome here because you're just going to bring that beef into this beef and you're going to pollute the community because here at Palm Harvest Church, we have a, we have a, we, we're going to be committed to working things out. Most relationships that we have in our life, and maybe you think about your marriages, maybe you think about your close fri friendships, I would venture to say you would all agree there's probably been conflict from time to time. It's a simple thing, you know, Rick knows, Rick, Rick Capco, uh, I'll walk with Rick usually on Tuesdays and Wednesdays with a, a, there's a couple other guys that we walk with, and one of the guys is really, he hates it when I talk about food uh, in the morning because he's trying to exercise, he's trying to lose weight, and so what do I do? I'm always talking about food, like, are, is anybody else hungry? I'm so hungry right now, and he gets upset with me, and, and it, it's a little, it's a fun little banter and stuff, but it, it just really reinforces that truth that sometimes even friends kind of rub each other the wrong way. Every relationship that has a value does. And Paul is saying here, you need to ask, you need to work on living relationally considerate. So sisters and brothers, 
I'm asking you, as you await for heaven's arrival, with whom is God inviting you to be relationally considerate? One more passage of scripture. Go back two chapters to Philippians chapter two. Look what Paul says. He's gonna give us some, he's gonna give us some pointers for how you and I can live relationally considerate, especially with those who we have a beef with, especially for those who we are maybe at odds with in our world. So Philippians chapter two, go to verse three. Philippians chapter two, verse three. Notice what Paul tells these Philippian Christians, what he tells you and me. He says, don't be selfish. You want to live relationally considerate? Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So how do you and I live relationally considerate, Paul tells us. He says, put other pe people's needs ahead of your own. Is that always easy, yes or no? No, it's not always easy. In fact, it's usually not even natural, but with God's help, you and I can. You know, I love Jesus' words. Remember what Jesus is? He was being hang hanging on the cross. He's about to give up his, his life. He's shedding his blood already for the sins of humanity. What was one of the prayers he said? Father, forgive them because what? They don't know what they're doing. I think a lot of times we hurt people un, unintended. In fact, in, in, in my relationship with Robin, and you know, I'll, early on, and sometimes still, I'll just say, oh, time out, babe, it's not, my, it's not my intent to hurt you. It's not my goal to, 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 to make you upset. You know, my goal is to, to, to make you happy because if you're happy, I'm happy, right? And so you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to help me. Learn to say this differently, or what is it that you need? It's not our goal to make people upset at us, hopefully not. But it's hard, and sometimes we do. And so Jesus says, Jesus, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. In their, in their case, there was their intent to hurt Jesus. But even Jesus took the high road, and he said, forgive them. He says, Father, forgive my abusers. Why? Because they're in need of your healing touch. Friends, you know, when we forgive others, you know what that does to our own heart? It keeps it pure. When we forgive others, it keeps our heart soft. You know, you've heard me talk about this all the time, and I, and I just, I'm always sharing this, this wisdom that people are going to hurt you in life. People are going to disappoint you. Love them anyways. And the higher you go in leadership and the more you're in a place of, 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 of leadership, even as a pastor, you, I just know people are going to betray me. I still have to love them. Because if I don't love people, if you don't love people, you know what happens to your heart? It gets closed. It gets hard. You become bitter. You become angry. You become that nasty person that you like to be critical of. And so we need to follow Jesus' example. And he's saying, until my arrival comes and it's going to be sudden and it's going to be quick, quick and it's going to be glorious when you get there, until my, my arrival comes, you need to live relationally considerate because the one who's going to benefit of having a forgiving heart is going to be you more than anybody. Friends, Christ is coming back. And when he does, for those of us, us who have asked Jesus to forgive our sins and be the Lord of our life, the Bible teaches that our names are going to be written in the book of life. Those whose names are written in the book of life will be welcomed and invited to spend all of eternity with God in his new heaven and his new earth. We know his return is going to be sudden. We saw that today. We know that heaven's return is going to come with a, a new chapter. But until that day arrives, you and I are called to live relationally considerate. So we're going to take communion here in a moment. And part of being communion is having a, the adoption, adopting the attitude of Jesus of putting a towel around our waist and washing the feet of the people who are even going to betray us. Did Jesus wash the feet of Judas? 
Did he wash it? Right, Peter? So who's betrayed you? So it's David, come on up. Join me up at the front here. We're going to go to a time of prayer. I want you just everybody to just kind of put everything down for a minute. Close your eyes. Not that there's anything spiritual about keeping your eyes closed. Rick and Nancy are going to make their way to the back because we're going to celebrate communion here in a moment. But before we get to communion, I ask you this question. With whom is God inviting you to reconcile? With whom is God inviting you to practice generosity with? So take a deep breath. Everybody take a deep breath. Inhale. And as you inhale and as you just center center down, I want you to begin with this prayer. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving and forgiving me. Thank you for loving and forgiving me. And now pray this. Say, Jesus, please help me to love and forgive and then you fill in the blank. There's someone in your world that you're at odds with right now. And maybe it's been generations, or not generations, but maybe it's been decades since you've seen this person, but instantly their their face or their name comes to your mind. And you just know, yeah, I'm, I'm still carrying a little bit in my backpack. This person's hurt me, they wounded me, they betrayed my trust, and I you have every reason to be upset with them. That being said, let it go. Just say, Jesus, please help me because on my own, I can't do this. Please help me to love and forgive and you fill in the blank. Who is that person? Who has wronged you? Who has hurt you? Maybe the person's name that you need to fill in the blank is your own name because you know that you've hurt somebody. And as you live your life every day and maybe you see this person or maybe, you know, who you you reflect on some memory, you recognize, man, I wish I could do things over again. Man, if if I could go back, I might not say it that way or say it differently or do something else. Maybe the person you need to forgive today is you. And I just want to tell you, Jesus has already forgiven you. He paid the price on the cross for you. So receive it. We don't deserve it. Receive it. Say, Jesus, please help me to love and forgive myself. Please help me to love and forgive what I did. And then say, Jesus, please help me to live differently, to move forward, to become the person that you want me to be because on my own, I can't do it. But with your help, I know and I believe that I can. Today, as we receive communion, I'm gonna lead us in a communion prayer here in a moment. But I invite you to dwell on this truth that Jesus loves you. He is for you. He is with you. And most importantly, he loves you. And as you look at the elements in a moment, you're going to go to the back and Rick and Nancy are back there. And the the bread represents the fact that Jesus, you know, how Jesus lived and how he calls us to love God and love our neighbor. And the the cup represents the truth that Jesus forgives us and he wants to be at work in our life and help us to be the person he's created us to be until he comes back. Just sit in that truth that God is with you, that he loves you, and that he calls you to love others. But first and foremost, just dwell in the pocket that he is for you. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. But for right now, I just want you to repeat in your mind these words. Say, Jesus is for me. In your mind, say, Jesus loves me. In your heart, say, Jesus has forgiven me. Say, Jesus is at work in my life, even in this moment, and is transforming me. 
And so now in your heart, with open hands, say, God, my hands are open. My heart is open. My mind is open. I invite your Holy Spirit to continue to help me to love those people and forgive those people who have hurt me. And I pray that you would help me to love those people myself, forgive those people myself as even as I have hurt others. Help me to be better. This is my communion prayer in Jesus' name. So now, sisters and brothers, having prayed these prayers, as you feel so led, go to the back. Nancy and Rick are there. Take the elements, come back and sit. And just sit in the, in the pocket, sit in the truth that God loves you and he is for you. Okay, so please get up and go as you feel, feel so led. And then we'll take communion together. And I will make room Do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to And I will make room Whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will. the story of the Last Supper as Jesus, you know, they're passing the meal, passing the bread and the cup, two cups of wine, actually. And then he wraps his towel around his waist and he goes, begins to go one by one as they all reclined around the table. And they're like, God, God, no, you know, Jesus, no, you, I should be washing your feet, right? And Jesus is like, no. I have to do this. And Jesus gets up and he says, what I've done for you, I'm calling you to do for others. Heaven's arrival is going to be sudden. It's going to usher in a new relational or a new chapter, life chapter. But until that time, I'm calling you to be relationally considerate. To take on in the attitude of being a servant. So as you hold these elements in your in your hands, who is God inviting you, whose feet is his wash inviting you to wash? It's easy to wash the feet of those who we love and you know, our grandkids and you know, those people we're in great relationship with, but how are those people who you're at odds with, who just ah, they rub you the wrong way? Anybody have anybody like that in their life? 
People disappoint you, you have expectations. You go to the back, those of you who went to the back and, and the communion elements ran out, Rick's got more. Was there a point in your heart when you went, oh, how, can we do, how can we know I'm more juice? Check your heart. So as Rick and Nasty come forward, if you didn't get any juice, raise your hand. He's got a couple more cups here. He's got the whole bottle there. But it reminds us of this truth, like, ah, there's still more in my heart. I, I still have more in me that can grow. Where is God inviting you to be? like him. Rick, thank you for running and getting more juice. Yeah, I'll grab one for David. You know, the serving of communion is significant because it really represents Jesus wrapping the towel around his waist and serving. Thank you, Nancy. So who's God inviting you to love today with increased measure that on your own you couldn't do it but with his help and with the help of our church family we can't notice Paul wasn't asking these two women to do it on their own he was calling upon the church to help them and so if you have someone in your life who you're a bit at odds with maybe you I would encourage you go to someone here and say hey I, I just as a form of accountability I got an issue with this person will you pray with me will you help carry this burden together so brothers and sisters, as we eat and we drink and we celebrate God's love for us, let's eat and drink and remember Christ. Jesus, thank you so much for going to the cross for my sins, for our sins. Thank you so much for loving your enemies, those that betrayed you. Thank you for giving us that example. And so Jesus, as we await your return and we look forward to eternity in the new heaven and the new earth that you are going to create. In the meantime, we pray that you would help us today live relationally considerate. Help us, God, to be generous people, generous with our time, generous with our money, generous with our possessions, generous with our positivity generous with our affirmation, generous with our gratitude, generous with our patience and peace and kindness and goodness. Help us, Jesus, to be relationally considerate until you come home. And now, sisters and brothers, before we end our time together, I want you to pray for somebody in your mind right now. Pray for someone who you're concerned about. Somebody who might be separated from God right now. Maybe they're angry at God or maybe they just are stubborn and they just don't want to give their heart to God. Will you just pray for them? It could be a neighbor. It could be a coworker. Now, please stand. Sisters and brothers of Palm Harvest Church, I bless you today with an increased amount of and a capacity in God's strength to be relationally considerate. You are his hands and feet. I bless you today, today in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great day, everybody.